It's a privilege to be here with you. And um, you know, I was at Pastor Peter's church, the previous church, a fortnight ago up at Mwamba. It was lovely to be there to see a lot of the good things he had put in place still, still, still happening. So I send you there all their greetings. And um, as I said before, I just, I, I just love this church. Everyone I know from this church is wonderful people. I'm so glad that you're here today. And um, before I get into the message, I just invite you to just bow your heads as we just pray. Dear Jesus, I just pray that you'll help us to take our minds off of everything in the world, everything that's going on in our busy life. And may your spirit come into our hearts and minds, help us just to focus on you and what you have for us. Please hide me behind the cross of Calvary, and may you be uplifted and glorified today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The deacons are going to pass something out to, to each one of you. Um, a sermon title today is Leftovers. Leftovers. You know, this, this, this North and South, yep, you can go ahead and pass them out. The North and South World Conference did research in 2016. So this is very recent research. Across the conference, 774 people participated in that. It's likely someone from this church also took the survey. And it is considered statistically valid because it was a large enough percentage of the, of the church that took this survey. And they made a lot of observations. This information is extremely valuable. Some of the key findings were that 89% of people in this conference believe that it is wrong to divert tithe. 40% believe, I mean, so even though they believe it's wrong to divert tithe, 40% of them are diverting tithe to Rotary, ICC, ADRA, etc. And that's true. That's what they actually said. For, you know, people are giving their tithe to, to Rotary. 64% have high confidence in our North, North New South Wales conference. 53% believe that the conference is the best place to send tithe to spread the gospel. And some of the things people could write in, and here's some of the things they said. One church member said, I've attended Seventh-day Adventist churches all of my life, and I have never heard a sermon or presentation on tithe, why it's important, why it's biblical, and the blessings involved. So if that was you and you're here today, you won't be able to say that anymore, okay? Because you're going to hear a presentation about it. One member said, I must admit, when I first became an Adventist, I was a bit scared about paying tithe at first of just how I would manage, but I've never been left wanting Another one said, it would be good to have meetings once in a while to tell Adventist members how tithes are being used, not just statistics, and allow them to ask questions so they can fully understand how tithes are being used. By the way, I speak quickly. If I'm really going too fast, and, you, and I'm, just put your hand up, and it'll remind me to slow down a bit. I get excited, and I also want to get through as much information as I can. 200 people are happy to share a personal story. Um, if you're one of those persons, you have a great story you want to share with me, please come and Talk to me afterward. We can set up a phone interview or I can, we can find a way. I would love to hear those stories and get those shared around the conference. My real passion, I want you to know, is about revival. Um, the last two churches I had, Kingscliff and Kempsey, had an increase of 250%. And it has nothing to do with this person standing before you. It has everything to do with the Holy Spirit and what God can do. Of the 100,000 pages of manuscript that Ellen White wrote... 10%, more than any other subject, she talked about the Holy Spirit. And this is a quote from one of those uh, first volume of Selective Messages, calls for revival, the church's great need. A revival of godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. God wants to do great things. And if this church gets together and prays, this church will more than double. I've seen it. I, I, I know it will happen. And some of you have visited Kingscliff Church over the years, and you know there's a change that's taken place. It's a different church than it was 20 years ago. And that's because the Holy Spirit's gotten a hold of many of the people there. And I long for this to take place in all of our churches. Um, so if, I'm, I'm, if Pastor Peter or the church want to have me back sometime and do a, presentations on this, I'd be happy to do that. That's my passion. What is tithe? What is tithe's purpose? Where should my tithe go? And what about offerings? We're going to cover that. We're told to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto us. We're told to seek first the kingdom of God. We know that we, know that we should do that, but are we doing that? 
The love of money, the desire for wealth, is the golden chain that binds men to Satan. You know, we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's this desire for more. And what I find about greed is that greed doesn't know any boundaries of, of socioeconomic classes. The poorest of the poor love to gamble and put money in for lotus because they long to be, have more money. And the rich people, they become a millionaire, then they want to become multimillionaire, then they want to become a billionaire. There is no end to the greed, is there? And how much is enough? If you look at a map of the whole world, how many of you know there's some very wealthy countries out there? Who knows what the richest median, that means on average, person, which country has the highest median of wealth in the world? Any guesses out here? Sorry? Which one? India? Not India. No, India has a lot of very, very poor people. It's not Australia. Qatar? They have a lot of wealth. It's not that one. It's Switzerland. Okay, Switzerland is the wealthiest. It surplaced a country before that, that for five years running was the highest median. That country is now the second highest median, wealthiest country in the world, which is the country of Australia. We are the second highest, richest country in the world. You can Google that, find out you know, for yourself. But we are the lucky country. We call ourselves a lucky country. That's because we are. We're far richer than America. Um, on average, and you think, well, compared to my neighbor, I'm not that rich. But compare yourself to your neighbor across the ditch or across the sea, Papua New Guinea, India, Asia, Africa, any of them. And if you have a house, if you live in a house, and you have a car to drive. You're already in the over 10% highest in the whole world. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money's not evil. It's the love of money. It's the discontentment of not having enough, of always wanting more, more, more. People say, if I just had more, I'd be content. The trouble is they get that little bit more, then they're not content. They want more. Um, the earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. God says, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. If that's what you're loving, you'll never have enough. Our money management reflects our walk with God. If a stranger, someone in the world were to take a look at your, your transactions, your bank account transactions, they didn't know you at all. They just looked at your transactions of where you put your money over the last year. They looked at your credit card and bank statements. Would they know that you were a Christian? If that's all they had, that's the only evidence they had was your, your statements of all your finances, would they know? The result of salvation produces a life of discipleship and obedience. You can't gain salvation by giving anything, by doing anything. It's a free gift. And the result is where it comes from. One cannot have Christ dwelling within them and remain the same. God promises to give us a new heart and a new spirit. He's the one that causes us to walk in his principles. As Christians, we are to be stewards of, you know, the whole quarter, last quarter, if you came to Sabbath school lessons, we're a part of this. But we're to be stewards of our body, God's temple. We're to be stewards of the gospel. To share that with the world, we're stewards of our time. You know, you could preach a whole sermon on each one of these individual topics. Time is this huge thing of which we're going to be held to account for. Our God-given talents and gifts, the earth and nature, these are just some of the things. But why do we give? You know, Christian motivations to give are to glorify God as our creator, to integrate God into the material side of our own lives, to show thanks for God's grace and blessings, and I think the very best reason is so that we can become like Jesus. For God so loved the world that he kept it all to himself. No. And when Jesus gave, when God gave, you know, did God have to kind of get the pitchfork out and kind of kick Jesus out of heaven? Get down there to those rat, rat bags on earth. They've kind of sinned. Go, you get down there. Is that what happened? Or was Jesus eager to come? He was eager to come. He came to this earth. He was so happy. He gave everything. All heaven was emptied. He longed to give everything he could, and he did give everything possible. He lived on this earth a very poor man. When he was in his public ministry, he had no house. He had no car. All he had were the clothes on his back. He had no spares. He had nothing, and yet he had everything, didn't he? And he was happy. He was smiling. He was positive. I know he was happy because the children gathered around him, and I've never seen children gather around grumpy people. I've never seen it. And Jesus was, he just had fun. You know, when I was a kid, I remember hearing uh, your story hour and the voice of Jesus was like this. Verily, verily, 
I say unto thee today. And I, and I grew up thinking that's the voice of Jesus. As I got older, I realized there's no way Jesus talked like that. There's no way. He wouldn't have had the crowds. You're not going to chase out to him in some desert, for, stand there for a whole day without eating and listen to him if he spoke like that. Jesus was interesting. He was a storyteller. He was fun and he was happy. You know, if you've seen the Matthew series of Jesus smiling all the time, almost laughing a lot, I love that picture of Jesus. I think it's the closest one that I know. He was a happy, he loved to give. He found great joy in giving. And he knows that you and I, to find great joy, we also are going to need to become givers. Biblical tithing. Tithing is not a matter of generosity or gratitude. It's a matter of honesty with God. All the tithe of the land is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord, God says. Tithe is a lot like Sabbath, almost identical. God says it's his. It's just, it's just what it is. Tithe is a tenth part of your income or our increase if we are self-employed. This is the first part of our God-given increase that he claims as his own. The word for tithe and tenth are interchangeable in both the Old and New Testaments. They mean the same thing, tithe and tenth. Anciently, the Lord instructed his people to assemble three times a year for his worship. To these holy convocations, the children of Israel came, bringing to the house of God their tithes, their sin offering, and their offerings of gratitude. Now, you know, when you come to tithe, tithe being a tenth, how many of you love mathematics? Do we have some mathematicians here? Oh, we got, there's a few. There's always a few in the audience, but most of them. How many of you really kind of don't like mathematics? It just kind of annoys you. Yeah, yeah it's more usually a lot more of those kind of people. You know, in America, when you go out to eat at a restaurant, there's these set percentages you're supposed to tithe at. And it's like, right now, I think it's up to like 17.5%. And, you know, if you go eat at a restaurant and you want to give your um, tip, You've got to pull out your calculator and figure it out. Because even if you're a mathematician, it's pretty complicated. 17.5%? Really? God asks for 10%. And you can be the most um, unmathematical person in the world. And it's super, super easy. Everybody can do tithe. You take the little decimal point, bloop, move it over. You got 10%. Super easy. God makes it super easy. Simple, clear. God could have asked for 50%. That's all his anyway. He makes it 10%. And the people would come and they would bring these things three times a year to these assemblies. Interestingly, the Israelites gave at least one-fourth of their income to God in the form of tithes, thank offerings, support for the temple, and gifts for the poor. I wish I had time to do a whole other sermon on second tithe. How many of you have ever heard of a second tithe before? We got a lot of you. Excellent. I've just learning, been learning heaps about it. It's really exciting. But the children of Israel, they gave heaps of their total amount. In fact, most of these donations were personally delivered by each family in kind or in cash equivalents to the st central storehouse, first at Shiloh, then at Jerusalem. They are away from home and work at least one month every year. So they're missing lots of time of work. They're giving lots of their income. Yet the 25% giving in the one month away from home, that's why Jews today are known as the poorest people on the planet. Right? What are Jews known as? Rich. Even if they... Interestingly, even if they have not accept, accepted Jesus, by following the biblical principles, they've become wealthy. It was actually the cause of their prosperity and blessing. Because actually when you join with Christ, you're far richer always than when you don't. The use of tithe. Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they performed, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. The Levites were specifically chosen by God to do this work of ministry. They were not allowed to have plots of land. They were not allowed to have careers like everybody else. They were completely dependent upon the rest of the other 11 tribes being faithful to God in returning their tithes. That's what it was for. And so we say, well, that's an Old Testament thing. New Testament confirms this. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. God wants people... Men and women who are committed to helping people with the most important aspect of our whole life, which is salvation. He wants them dedicated to that and not torn between trying to be a painter and a builder and a mechanic and a doctor and everything else and also do this. God calls all those other people to be ministers as well. But there's some specialists or full-timers that God wants, and that is where the tithe is supposed to go for. It is clear that God's chosen purpose for the tithe was to support the religious leaders and their families. So what is the central storehouse? 
Malachi 3 says, will a man rob God? God's asked his own question. Yet you are robbing me, God says. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. God says, bring it all into the central storehouse. Bring it all into the storehouse. And God says, test me now in this. This is the only time in all the Bible where God says, challenges us in this way. He knows that we are very connected to our wallets. He knows that. So he says, look, test me. Try me. Try me. See. See for yourself. Many people have tested God in this. And guess what? He's never failed them. He doesn't fail. So what is the central storehouse? The central storehouse was the place whereby it was distributed to the ministers of the gospel to share the gospel with the world. And so, in harmony with this Bible principle, the Seventh Day Adventist Church has designated the local conference as the storehouse to which the tithe should be returned and from which the gospel ministers receive their salaries. That's where it goes. Tithe goes to the, 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 the conference, and we have a mission to spread the gospel to the whole world, to our neighbors, to our friends, and, and, and to the rest of the world. And so that is, is what we do as a church, which has been given the everlasting gospel to share to the world. You who have been withholding your means from the cause of God, read the book of Malachi and see what is spoken there in regard to tithes and offerings. Cannot you see that it is not best under any circumstances to withhold your tithes and offerings because you are not in harmony with everything your brethren do? Some people say, well, look, my local pastor, maybe he's not good. You have a great minister, by the way. Some people say, my local conference, they're shockers. I don't agree with what the conference is doing. I'll just withhold my tithe. This is in response to that that we're given this. The tithes and offerings are not the property of any man, but are to be used in doing a certain work for God. Unworthy ministers may receive some of the means thus raised, but dare anyone because of this withhold from the treasury and brave the curse of God? I dare not. She says, I pay my tithes gladly and freely, saying as did David, of your own we have given you. A selfish withholding from God will tend to poverty in our own souls. Act your part, my brethren and sisters. God loves you and he stands at the helm. If the conference business is not managed according to the order of the Lord, that is the sin of the erring ones. The Lord will not hold you responsible for it if you do what you can to correct the evil. But do not commit sin yourselves by withholding from God his own property. Cursed be he that does the work of the Lord negligently or deceitfully. Now, in this conference, we have wonderful, wonderful leaders. Our conference president, Tom Evans, is a beautiful man of God. Paul Geelan, some of you know him when he was his days up here at Lismore, great man of God. And our treasure is probably the best treasure in the world. Most treasures I've worked under, you have any idea, there ought, you are... You, no point in even talking to them, asking them any question, because the answer is always the same. No. Every time. Russell Halliday is not like that. He says, but the money may not be there, but if this is what God's put in your heart, and this is a mission that God wants to happen, we've got to find a way to do it. He is a very godly man. Many of you know him. He's a wonderful. We have no excuses in this conference. Many people, visitors from overseas have come here and said, this is the best conference in the world. They're really impressed with the conference leadership that we have. Tithe is returned through the local church where membership is held. The local treasurer then sends the tithe to the conference storehouse from which religious workers are paid. Any tithe that's returned here at Alstonville, none of it goes directly to your pastor or to me or to anybody at the conference. It's all taken by your treasurer. 100% of the tithe that's given is given to the conference. What does the conference do with it? Here's what our conference does with it. North East Wells Wells Conference, Gospel Workers Evangelism is 57% of the tithe. The worldwide church, the conference actually ties the tithe. They take 20% of it and they pass it on to the union. The union keeps the percentage and passes a percentage on to the division. The divisions around the world make up the general conference. Okay, that's where the money goes. Administration is 8%. These are some of the guys I just mentioned to you and other people. Then you have the conference departments, people like Darren Pratt, Matt Parra. Uh, just to mention a few, there's many others. Great men of God and women of God are there too because it includes the secretary's salaries. Education, 3%. And camps and conventions, one coming up very soon, big camp, is another 3%. So that is currently where the tithe in this conference is going. It's going to the gospel ministry. That's what it's supposed to go for. This matter of giving is not left to impulse. God has given us definite instruction in regard to it. He has specified tithes and offerings as the measure of our obligation. Let each regularly examine his income, which is all a blessing from God, and set apart the tithe as a separate fund to be sacredly the Lord's. This fund should not in any case be devoted to any other use. It is to be devoted solely to the support of the ministry of the gospel. 
After the tithe is set apart, let gifts and offerings be apportioned as God has prospered you. Evidently, on several occasions, folks came to Ellen White asking how to properly make restitution of back tithe. Many confessed that they had not paid tithes for years, and we know that God cannot bless those who are robbing him, and that the church must suffer in consequence of the sins of its individual members. There are a large number of names on the church books, and if all would be prompt in paying an honest tithe to the Lord, which is his portion, the treasury would not lack for means. In fact, I found this one uh, interesting. She says, if you have robbed the Lord, make restitution. As far as possible, make the past right, and then ask the Savior to pardon you. So if you're there saying, look, I've not been returning tithe for a long time. I want to do this. God will help you. This is the one that really startled me, and I never noticed this before I took on this role. To defraud God is the greatest crime of which man can be guilty, and yet this sin is deep and widespread. And I've wrestled with that. Well, how could that be the greatest? Wouldn't you think that murdering, adultery, stealing, aren't there other things that you think would be on God's radar up higher? But we're told that to defraud God is the greatest crime of which man can be guilty. How is it? As I think about it, it's, I see it like this. Here is God constantly pouring into your life and my life blessing after blessing after blessing. Our heart is beating because of God's blessing, is it not? God is a giver. He's constantly giving. And if his people are takers, 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 and never share any of that blessing, we're like the Dead Sea. We're hoarding all for ourselves. We are selfish. We're the opposite of what God is. God is a giver of everything. And he wants us to become like him. And if we are receiving from God and not giving, then that's how we're defrauding God and his whole character, what, what it's all about. Second Chronicles chapter 31. Starting in chapter 29, we have the story of Hezekiah. Hezekiah comes to the throne. His dad was a really horrible guy. All these idols have been set up. And Hezekiah comes to the throne in, in Second Chronicles chapter 29. And the Bible says in the first... Um, let me just get there. Open your Bibles. Second Chronicles chapter... 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. So you notice the very beginning of Hezekiah's ministry. His dad was an evil man. It says, verse 2, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord his God. Verse 3 says, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. In the, immediately, he set out to restore the temple services. The Levites weren't even serving in the temple. The temple was not even being used. He had to reinstitute the Passover service, etc. He set out to do this, and he did that. And um, there's a lot else, else that took place. I don't have time to cover it all, um, but he got the country back on track. Chapter 31, verse 1 says, Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars in pieces, cut down the wooden images, and threw down the high places and the altars from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his possession. And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and the Levites according to their divisions, each man according to his service, the priests and Levites for burnt offerings, peace offerings, to serve, to give thanks, to praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord." because this had not been happening. The king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths and the new moons and the set feasts, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and Levites, that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the city of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month, they began laying them in heaps, and they finished in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left. For the Lord has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance. When the people returned their tithe and offerings, there was plenty. There was plenty. The reason there hadn't been plenty was the people weren't doing this. If you come down to the end of this chapter, it says, um, also for this... 
for the sons of Aaron the priest who were in the fields of the common lands of their cities, in every single city there are men who are designated by name to distribute portions to all the males among the priests and to all who were listed by the genealogy among the Levites. Notice this. Here people bring in oil, sheep, all these kind of things, big, heavy things into the central historic of Jerusalem. They then had to haul all those big, heavy items out to the other cities. And there were people apportioned, being paid by tithes in those cities, and then take it and distribute it. We have a much simpler system today. We have a treasury team at the conference office that put, push a few buttons and it's sent electronically into the bank accounts. We don't have to have a local person at everywhere to do the work. Verse 20 says, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. He did it with all his heart. Right after this, this evil guy Sennacherib comes to wipe him out. He says, every other nation I've wiped out, they, they retrusted their gods. Their gods failed them. What makes you think your gods any different? And Hezekiah and the people went to God. And guess what God did? He completely protected them and saved them and rescued them. On a very consistent basis, Ellen White urged church members to make sure their accounts with God were square at the end of every year. Regarding experience in Australia, she stated, one brother, a noble-looking man, a delegate from Tasmania, came to me and said, I'm glad I heard you speak today upon tithing. I didn't know it was so important a matter. I dare not neglect it any longer. He is now figuring up the amount of his tithe for the last 20 years and says he will pay it as fast as he is able, for he cannot have robbery of God registered in the books of heaven. Meet him in the judgment. One reason is that tithe may be applied to school purposes. Still others reason that canvassers and call porters should be supported from the tithe. But a great mistake is made when the tithe is drawn from the object for which it is to be used to the support of the ministers. There should be today in the field 100 well-qualified laborers where, that, where now there is but one. How many more workers should we have? 100 more workers. But you know what? If we do the math in our conference, if every single church member returned a double tithe as tithe, we wouldn't have 100 fold. Not even close. Not even close. But she says there should be 100 workers where now there's one. We'll couple that with this statement. If all of the tithes of our people flowed into the treasure of the Lord as they should, such blessings would be received that gifts and offerings for sacred purposes would be multiplied tenfold. Now you get your mathematician hat on, you'll fly something tenfold. That's a thousand percent increase. And thus the channel between God and man would be kept open. It's kind of like God asks us to do a little bit and God says, I'll do so much more. It's like when he told them to cross the Red Sea. The, fer the priests had to put their toes into the water. Did they not? They didn't really part the water. I mean, they made part of the bit their foot went in and just, I mean, just moved it temporarily. Then God moved the whole thing, right? When we combine our tiny amount with God, God does the major amount. And this is what God wants to do. You know, we know in our conference right now, we need twice as many churches as we have. We don't have the budget to support twice as many pastors. And I'm working on church planting right now. I, that's half of my job. I'm the only half guy in the church, in, in the conference that's 50% trying to plant a church. I can't do it on my own. God's going to have to help or it's going to fail. But God's going to help. I know he will. I have complete confidence in him and none in myself. And that's why it's going to succeed because it's all about God's work. But God wants this to happen and it could happen. Now, do we return or do we pay tithe? You know, I snatched this purse with a lady. She snuck out. She didn't see. She was out of, the, out of here. So I just went and picked, pinched, her, pinched, pinched her purse. It's a pretty nice looking purse here. It's leather and, you know, it's kind of shiny little bits here. It's lovely. Isn't it lovely? Probably doesn't suit me very well. My wife might like it better. But, you know, um, I think it's Amber, right? Yeah, this is Amber's purse. Amber, I have five boys, as you know. And, you know, we live in a little farm and a house there. And our house isn't always perfectly clean. You know, if you would come down and, and give me some of your time and you, I, could, I could give you some work to do, maybe some babysitting and some, some dishes, some vacuuming, there's some work to be done. I, I'm sure I could find in here some money to pay you with. I'm happy to pay you with it. I'm sure there's a fair bit in here. And you know, if, if there's not that much, I could still pay you with a nice purse. You think that's a good exchange if you want to come down and work for me and I'll pay you from here? Does that make any sense? You can't. This is the point I'm making about tithe. We can't pay tithe. Because it's not ours to start with. Just as I couldn't pay her from what's already hers, it wouldn't make any sense. God says the tithe is already his. So there's no way I can pay it. I can only return what God claims as his own. Tithe is not a 10% blackmail payment to God. 
so we can do what we want with the other 90%. Neither is tithe a tip to God, thanking him for what we have received. Julian Archer, great guy, great man of God, I love what he says. He says, tithe is not a sign of your generosity. It is a sign of your honesty to God. Tithe is not an offering. Tithe is not a donation. So don't return your tithe to a cause that asks for offerings and donations. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You know, my concern is not that we as a conference increase our offerings and tithes. I, that's not my concern. As God's my witness, I don't care about those. I care about your own heart, your own life. I want you to be right with God. I want you to have the blessing God wants you to have. I want you to be walking in a relationship with God that's, that's positive. So what about offerings? Our offerings come from 90% that remains in our possessions after we turn our tithe to God. There were sin offerings, thank offerings, other kinds of offerings that people would give to God. Failure to bring tithes and offerings was considered by God to be robbery. And um, unlike tithe, offerings can be discretionary. You can choose what offerings go for. By the way, if you only return your tithe and no offerings, this church is going to shut down in no time. Because if all the tithe goes to the conference, what's going to pay your electric bill? What's going to help you with your local evan evangelism? What's going to help with your Sabbath school supplies and your classes that you have here? Everything the local church does is dependent upon offerings. And today, the offering went for the local church. And in this conference, it's done, done well. About 6% of the offerings go to help the local church. That's what it should. Um, Jesus portrays money as a direct competition with God and speaks of the impossibility of serving both God and mammon. Both Cain and Abel brought offerings, by the way, but God only accepted the offering from the obedient heart. You know, God didn't, God didn't really want the offering from Cain. He wanted the right offering, what he asked for, but not something from a heart that they didn't want. God does not receive the offerings of any because he needs them and cannot have glory and riches without them, but because it is for the interest of his servants to render to God the things which are his. Who is benefited by offerings? You are. You know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God will be just fine if you never return tithe or you never give any offerings to God. He'll be just fine. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. The free will offerings, the free will. This is something, hey, I want to do this. I'm not here to guilt trip you. I will not guilt trip you. I don't believe in that kind of method. I'm not going to manipulate you. The free will offerings of the humble, contrite heart he'll receive and will reward the giver with the richest blessings. He receives them as a sacrifice of grateful obedience. Was God so excited about the widow that gave her two mites because it was 100% of her income? No. It was because it was 100% of her heart. Okay? That's what God was excited about. It was the heart. The psalmist challenges us, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Tithes a test of loyalty. Offerings are a test of attitude. Um, today, there's a wonderful thing called e-giving. You can go onto your app on your phone or on the website, and you can go there, and you can do it all electronically. You can select Alstonville as your local church and put in your tithes and offerings, and your treasure will be much appreciative if you do it that way because it saves them a lot of work. If all of our churches would do this, more and more people do this, it would make it a lot easier on our treasures. Some people say, well, the, but I want my kids and other people to know that I do support the church. Well, take a bit out as cash if you want in your offerings. I have a special uh, pocket in my wallet that's just offering money. So I'm seen to be giving. But we give most of our, ours online because that's just a simple, easy way to do it. If you want to support Southwest Rocks, it's now online too. Okay. Shameless, shameless, shameless advertisement. Um, big Camp Appeal. You know, Big Camp, we've started taking up special offering to help things like the Arise, to help Bible workers, to help, um, there's been other projects, I can't remember them all. In 2016, they had a goal to raise 300,000, maybe it was 250, I don't remember, but we made that goal. Last year, they, the goal was for 500,000. We actually got 590 some thousand. Some money came in after this was done. About 590,000 last year. This year, they're aiming for a million dollars. And it's going for very good projects. There's a great big Newcastle mission coming up next year. Um, David Halp wants to start a special thing to reach Aboriginal people and, and that whole community. Um, and there's, there's a few other projects in there. I don't remember them all, right? I should have them all on top of my head. But the conference is, this is for above and beyond what's happening with our current tithes and offerings. And if God impresses you to start setting money aside this year or even next year, then, you know, this conference is doing great things. Planting churches. A lot of it's gone to plant churches as well. Ultimately, if you look, openly you're looking for a revival of primitive godliness where members recommit their entire lives, time, talents, temple, and treasures to God. Julian Archer. There's this famous guy at Alstonville. Some of you might know him. He says this. 
I count success in a month, not by how much I've made, but by how much I've given away. Isn't that interesting? It's the flip-flop what the world says. The world says you're successful by the more you get. But in God's kingdom, success is in the more you give, the more you give. My kids have recently been watching some YouTube clips of these people that are quite well-to-do. They're not even Christians, but they just go into restaurants and they, they give the waiters these huge tips or the pizza delivery guy, they give them a $100 bill. And to see the people and the reaction on people's face, they have so much fun giving away money, just blow people away. You think, man, what could you do if you had some success? Benefits of something have ties and offerings. I just want to show this briefly. Our system is there's no other one like it in the whole world. It is absolutely awesome. If you faithfully return your tithes and you give your offerings, you are effectively helping the gospel go to the entire world. Did you know that? A portion of your money, most of it stays local, but it also goes to our union. It goes to our division. It goes to the whole world. Our offerings do this. And if you want to give offering to another project around the world, if you take your money and you send it to them, 100% of what you give goes to the project you've elected for, except for if it's in different foreign currency, the banks take a exchange rate. We can't stop that as a church. But there's another organization like it. When I was in America, Hurricane Katrina happened, and people that were giving to Hurricane Katrina were disgusted and appalled when they found out that the organizations taking money to help the, the, the victims and survivors of the hurricane there in New Orleans were, ta- were scalping 50 to 90% of what was given to help the people. It's just annoying. But in our church, it doesn't happen. If you want to give to a project in anywhere in this conference or in Western Australia, anywhere in our country, 100%, because the workers don't need to take anything from it because they're paid from the tithe. It is a beautiful system. It's absolutely wonderful. The Lord does not need our offerings, but this is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. And I would say that our offerings there would include our life, our time, our service. It's not just money. Make that very clear. So we say, I have no money. I can't return God. No, no. It's, it's, it's beyond that. John Wesley said, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. Second Corinthians 9, I love this verse. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you want to give, give. If you don't want to give, please don't. But the only one you're hurting is yourself. That's who you're hurting. Some of you might have a fridge that looks a little bit like this. When I grew up as a kid, I'm one of seven children. Our fridge often times looked like that. My grandparents went through the Great Depression. And even though my dad was a medical doctor, for a short while in my childhood, we went through a very, very tough financial time. I can remember jumping in the back of great big bins behind the big supermarkets and finding all kinds of goodies because we didn't have food to eat. We found food to eat. Donuts, breads, all kinds of stuff, you know, day-old milk, it's fine. And um, so we would do this. So in our house, we didn't want to throw food away. To this day, if you see me with a plate of food, it's gone. I never, I never waste food. If I take it, I eat it, you know, unless it's poisonous or something like that. And, but when I was little, our, we would, because we didn't want to say we didn't want to lose any food, there might be, you know, a few tablespoons of oatmeal left after breakfast. Well, you can't throw it away, can't waste it. So we'd stick it in one of those little Tupperware containers and stick it in the fridge. And our fridge became a permanent science experiment. And we'd pull something out. I mean, now Charlotte, was, you, you taste it to see if it's good. No, you taste it. I remember having those discussions many times. I hated tasting things that had gone off. Just, ugh. I asked my wife this day, I'm not a fan of leftovers. I don't like leftovers. Well, we had a, um, sorry, still, still my thunder. Um, we had a lady, my, when my mom was pregnant with the youngest two of my seven siblings, uh, of my six siblings, seven of us, they were twins. And the last few months, she had to be bedridden. The oldest was like seven years old. And so she, we had a maid come live in our house to do cooking for us children. Now, this lady, she didn't like the fridge looking like that. So she had a solution. And her solution... She kept the fridge clean, and this is what she did. All the leftovers that were saved throughout the week, on Thursday afternoon, she would pull all the leftovers out of the fridge. Breakfast leftovers, lunch leftovers, tea leftovers, sweet, savory. She took all the leftovers. She mixed them all together, (laughs) stir it all up, put it in a casserole dish, bake it in the oven. Here's tea, kids. She didn't say tea was America. Here's your supper. And to this day, I can still taste some of those dishes. And it's not a fond memory. It was disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. You know, leftovers. What are we serving Jesus? You know, if he came to your house, 
Do you think you would serve him leftovers? What about with our time? Do we do everything we want during the day, and if we have a little spare time, we'll give it a little to the church, a little to Jesus? You know, do we, do we spend everything we want with our money, and then if we have any leftover, we we'll give it to Jesus? Do we use our talents for our own endeavors, and if we have anything left over, we give it to Jesus? Is that what we're giving to Jesus? Are we giving Jesus our leftovers? You know, there's 40 references to tithes in the Bible, and there's eight references as a tenth, which are tithes. So 48 references of tithes. It's interesting, though, this, there's this thing called first fruits. First fruits is a thing where there's 58 scriptural references, even much more than tithes, this idea of this first fruits. Ezekiel 16 says, you offered yourself, this is a, this whole passage, I don't have time to go through it all, but God basically says, here was this, this baby. It was born, it was chucked out into the field, it was bloody, its umbilical cord wasn't even cut, it was completely neglected, it was left there to die. And God says, I came, I picked up this baby, and it's you and me. It was the nation of Israel, but it's us. He said, I picked you up. I cared for you. I did all these wonderful things to you. And I, as you grew up, you matured, and I put beautiful clothes on you. I decked you out in jewels. You were beautiful. He says, and then this is what you did. You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. You also committed harlotry with Egyptians. Therefore, I stretched out my hand against you. You also played the harlot with the Assyrians because you were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and were still not satisfied. How degenerate is your heart? God is trying to say something to you and I today. You know, that next TV series that you think you'll finish and you'll be satisfied, you won't. There'll be another TV series. That Hollywood movie that you think is so great, there'll be a sequel or maybe not, but you're not going to be satisfied. All your Facebooking, all of your gaming, all of your everything in this world offers, you can chase after it and chase after it and chase after it. It will not satisfy you, friends. These idols of this world are going to pass one day. And they don't, they leave you hollow. They leave you empty. You know, you, people that are addicted to pornography, they, they just want more and more. Alcohol, you want more and more. Gambling, you, you, you just gamble, gamble, gamble. There's no end. But God has something better. Isaiah 55, God makes this call. He says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. God says, you can be filled. There's another way. Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. God says, look, there's another way. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Many, many verses like this where God says, give him your best. Give God your heart. Give him everything that you have and you will find that you will have more than you can ever imagine. You, your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats are gonna overflow with new wine. You're gonna receive so many blessings. You, won't, you cannot outgive God. You'll, you'll taste and see that the Lord is good for yourself. You'll bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. God's testing our hearts. This is what it's like. He wants to see. Where's your heart? Are you giving God the leftovers or are you giving God the first place in your life? Look at this, this is an awesome. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. God asks us to give first fruits, and look what God gives us. God gives us first fruits, even before we give him. God gives us the first fruits of those who are asleep, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ at his coming. What's the first fruits that we receive? Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. It's his resurrection. It's his eternal life. Jesus gives himself to every one of us freely. That's the first fruits of heaven. That's the first fruits of everything. And when I compare what, what the first fruits that God gives to me in the person of Jesus Christ, what of anything that I have is in comparison to that? All of my first fruits are nothing compared to the person of Jesus Christ. And when you understand this, you have a heart that says, God, you've given me so much. I want to give. I would love to return back to you because I want to, because you're awesome. The promise cards have been passed out. I haven't covered all these areas. This is from the division. By the way, if you want to um, cross out promise and write choose, feel free to do so. The reason I say that is because people make a promise and then you don't do something and the devil comes and beats you up. Don't give them the opportunity. Say, I choose. We did this with smoking a long time ago. I choose not to smoke because even if you did, well, you're still choosing. So even if you don't do this, you're still choosing. That's the path you want. You choose to set apart first moments of every day to commune with the Lord through prayer, study of Bible, spirit of prophecy, Sabbath school lesson, family worship. By the way, these cards I'm not going to collect. This is between you and God. Just as your finance between you and God. I'm never going to check your bank accounts. I'm never going to check your tithe records at your local church. As a pastor, I never did. I never checked the local members if they were giving or not. It's none of my business. I don't believe it. 
It's all between you and God. If you want to receive the blessings, go for it. Um, but God wants to spend time with you to improve your relationships, growing in faithfulness, forgiveness, loving principle, to establish one new healthy habit, to better serve the Lord with your mind, to offer one day or evening each week to work with God, spreading the good news to others through Bible studies, small groups, etc. If you want to do that one, please talk to your pastor, Pastor Peter, and say, look, I want to give a week, a night, make sure work with work with your local church and how that's going to happen. To keep the Sabbath, prepare it for it accordingly on Friday, keeping its limits, rights, thoughts, activities. To faithfully return the Lord's tithe, 10% of your income. And the last one is to dedicate a regular percentage of your income as a free will offering to the Lord. I highly recommend that. Just take a percentage of your, I'll tithe this 10%. Your offering, just pick a percent. I won't tell you a percent. Pick a percent. If you've already done that, think about increasing it a little bit. But take a percent. My wife and I do this, and it's amazing because there's a certain amount that we give each week, and there's a certain amount we just keep in reserve for whatever things come up. And it's so nice to be able to do things, and in time it builds up. You end up with a very nice amount there that you can just do wonderful things to help your local church, mission, people, whatever you want to use that for. Um, and with the help of God help, you want to do those things. So I really encourage every one of you in your walk with God. And I just remember what God's after is not your money because he can get money from anyone else. He owns it all. But there's something that you have that he can't get from everybody else, and that's your heart. And that's what he wants. That's what he desperately is searching after is your heart. And I pray that every one of you will give of your very best to the master. And that's our closing song today is give of your best to the master. Let's just pray. Dear Jesus, we're so thankful that you have given so much. You've demonstrated how happy a person is who gives everything, which is yourself. Dear Jesus, we know that you're filled with joy and you want to fill our hearts with that same kind of joy. I pray that every one of us will receive that new heart, that new mind that you want to put in us, that we will become like you, that we as your people can give to our community a, a true picture of who you are, that many more will be a part of your kingdom because of your love and your life in us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.